Well, nope. okay. I'm sorry to have to move things along, but I have to move things along. And uh, le join me in welcoming our next speaker, Lee Piercy, uh, who is a lecturer at Bryn Mawr College, and also on the editorial committee of the Database of Classical Scholars, where I think, Michelle, you can find many of the classicists that you talked about. Is that the case? You can find some. Some. They're not on there, all of them. But uh, Michelle, too, is also on the editorial committee of the Database of Classical Scholars. And many of you will know that um, Ward Briggs, our last speaker, is, has been very instrumental in setting that up and tracking down um, names and images and so forth. But um, Lee um, is himself known for uh, outstanding accomplishments in both scholarship and teaching teaching, for example, that earned him the, in 2012 the APA's Pre-Collegiate Teaching Award, his uh, book, um, The Grammar of Our Civility, Classical Education in America, appeared in 20, 2005, nothing less than an intellectual history of the teaching of classics, as determined by Europe in the United States, which um, has been very important to um, the discussion of the history of the teaching of the classics in North America. Um, we're delighted to have Lee explore that topic, I believe, further today. I should say, make an editorial note, that, um, and this gives you a, a, perhaps a sense of the kind of uh, careful and attentive scholar uh, and um, colleague that Lee is. He wrote to me. Um, making sure that it would be okay if he changed his title to the APA and academic virtue and no longer speaking as a classicist, the APA in American politics. He explains it to me thus, that although the abstract, his abstract, promises to reveal that our discipline, as represented by the APA, has frequently addressed political issues with the language of epistemological virtue, and the paper does still do that, as he wrote it, the political receded into the background and the transition from moral to epistemological virtue came forward. Well, that is certainly fine by me, Lee, and I'm sure by our audience members, too. So please join me once again in welcoming Lee Piercy and his exposition of the APA and academic virtue. Well, thank you, Matt, for that introduction. And I'm going to put that right there, honey. And thank you to Eric and Michelle for those papers. I look forward to awards. I want to start with a story. Uh, in the mid 70s, when I was teaching at St. Olaf College, uh, one of my colleagues and also my next door neighbor was a man named Howard Hong. And he may be known to some people in this room. Uh, he was a distinguished professor of philosophy and also the preeminent English translator of Kierkegaard. Um, well, one evening, Howard and I were at one of those meetings where the topic of discussion was the product of scholarship in the humanities. It's still a live question in this era of maker spaces and STEM. What do we classicists and English professors and philosophers do what do we make? And the meeting, as such meetings are apt to do, went on and on. And finally, Howard stood up and said, the only thing that scholarship in the humanities produces is scholars in the humanities. Well, I had no idea what he meant. Uh, I'm not sure I do now. But I'm going to take advantage of the sad fact that Howard can't argue among the living uh, and uh, put words in his mouth. I think he may have been urging us to think about the belief that academic scholar in the scholarship in the humanities is an ethical endeavor. It's a kind of spiritual exercise that aims to cultivate virtue in those who practice it. And by scholarship, I don't mean just publishing peer-reviewed books and articles, but any thoughtful, learned engagement with the classical world. If we had time this morning, we could follow the idea that scholarship in that large sense aims at moral improvement back through John Henry Newman and the Renaissance humanists all the way to the Proarchia. But for our immediate purposes, 
it's, it'll be enough, I think, to point to the nearly universal curriculum of the American antebellum colleges from which most of the founders of the APA took their departure. And this is the way William C. We've heard about that uh, curriculum from Matt in his introduction. And this is the way William C. Ringenberg describes it. Latin and Greek language and literature, mathematics, a little science, and the famous senior level course, usually taught by the president to the seniors in moral philosophy, typically a combination of the social sciences, philosophy, and theology. Now, this curriculum formed the matrix from which the American Philological Association emerged in 1869. This morning, I'd like to suggest that the, the formation and growth of our philological society did not mean abandoning the idea that some kind of personal virtue was a goal of classical studies. Instead, moral development moved from being the single unifying goal in the embodied in a capstone course, to being one aim among many. And epistemic virtue replaced moral virtue as the ethical justification for our activities. And I'll just have a little time to suggest that we may now be witnessing the emergence of another idea about what it is to be a good scholar, that is, an ethically good scholar. So let me sketch briefly the framework of the model I'm working with. What does it mean to be good? And why should we want to perform good actions? Uh, philosophers nowadays point to a 1958 paper by Elizabeth Anscombe as the stimulus for the modern revival of Aristotle's principal answer to these questions, the idea of virtue ethics. Virtue ethics emphasizes moral character. Being good means having the virtues of a good person. And we perform good actions because they accord with these virtues. We give money to charity on this model because we believe that charitableness is a virtue and we want to enact that virtue. Virtue ethics contrasts with two other answers. One emphasizes duties or rules, a deontological approach as the philosophers say. And on this view, we give money to charity because we believe by doing so, we're following a rule that we ought to follow, do unto others, or something like that. And a third approach, called consequentialist, emphasizes the outcomes of actions. We give money to charity because we believe that doing so will have a good effect of some kind. It's easy to see, I think, that the American antebellum classical curriculum, with that capstone course in moral philosophy, depended on the idea that good scholarship aimed at pr producing virtue in scholars. And that idea isn't specifically American. It goes right back to the very heart of our academic discipline. At the beginnings of modern classical scholarship, Friedrich August Wolf grudgingly admitted that Altertums Wissenschaft, like the Studia Humaniora that he thought it ought to replace, contributes somewhat to the perfection of the human being little grudging somewhat in there, but he did believe it. So what happened at the founding of the APA in Poughkeepsie to this idea of scholarship as an incubator of virtue in scholars? A careful look at the first issue of our proceedings shows that rather than being pushed off to the side by a new ideal of scientific, ethically neutral scholarship, the idea that classics aims at inculcating virtue was being subtly modified not only by the pressure of the, the new ideal, but also by the force of new ideas about the place of classics in education and of education in American life. On the evening of July 28, 1869, at our founding event in, in Poughkeepsie, Benjamin Woodridge Dwight, 1816-1889, read a paper with a long title. It was called The Desirableness of Thorough Classical Study to the Attainment of the Ends of Higher Education. And Dwight's paper was a direct response to an article with a short title, Charles W. Eliot's The New Education, which had appeared in the Atlantic Monthly just six months earlier. Eliot, as Eric has reminded us, called for a system of education, as he said in the article, based chiefly upon the pure and applied sciences, the living European languages and mathematics instead of upon Greek, Latin, and mathematics as in the established college system. 
Eliot claimed that such an education would have two aims. First, to prepare a boy, and it is 1869, uh, to be something other than a preacher or a learned man so that he could follow any business or other active calling. And second, to send him forth trained and armed to work out the awful problem of self-government. Eliot, that is, wanted collegiate education to be a practical preparation for economic and civic life. Dwight countered Eliot by positing a different aim. Dwight asked, what kind of education shall be given to the favored few whose advantages, time, and circumstance give them the position of leaders in the intellectual movements of the world? And not surprisingly, his answer was a slight extension and modification of that traditional classical curriculum that we heard about. And the goal of that education, he said, was found in the development of intellectual power, securing the best use of this power, and the capacity of patient, persevering labor directed to worthy objects. Dwight, that is, wanted a curriculum, in contrast to Eliot, consisting of Latin, Greek, mathematics, and moral philosophy to do its traditional job, promoting virtue and an elite. Dwight sounds like a defender of the status quo against an attack from within, and to some extent, he certainly was. He was the grandson of a president of Yale taking on the just about to be president of Harvard. What makes his speech to our founders worth attention though is a very slight shift that I think we can notice in the kind of virtue that his classics promoted. Note that Dwight wanted not merely a governing elite but leaders in the intellectual movements of the world. And that for him, the aim of education was the development of intellectual power. Dwight's paper coincides, I think, with the beginning of a shift from thinking of classical scholarship as an activity that promotes moral virtue to thinking of it as one that promotes epistemic virtue. We all know moral virtues. Those are the qualities like those that interested Aristotle, generosity, courage, temperance, and the like. But you can be a generous, brave, temperate person without being much of a scholar or even a good student. Epistemic virtues, on the other hand, are qualities that lead to truthful knowledge, and it's hard to imagine scholarship without them. For some philosophers, like Ernest Sosa, epistemic virtues are whatever qualities, innate or acquired, enable us to attain truths. Qualities like reliable vision, uh, memory, reasoning. For other scholars like Linda Zagzebski, epistemic virtues resemble those of Aristotle's person of practical virtue, the phronimos. They're the traits for which we can be responsible, tra acquired habits that motivate us to aim at knowledge and act on that motivation, and that lead to reliable success in gaining true beliefs. And those are qualities like open-mindedness, intellectual courage, and so on. Our first proceedings record that Dwight's speech was followed by an animated discussion. And the only topics that provoked similar discussion were the question of the best pronunciation of Greek and Latin and a proposal to establish a graduate school somewhere in the US in linguistics and philosophy. And we remember that this was a time when there were no postgraduate programs in anything but medicine, law, theology, and a few branches of natural science. And Dwight seems to have touched a nerve at its founding, the pioneers of the APA were eager to stake a claim alongside the Smithsonian, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the new universities that were then just on the horizon in the recently opened territory of scientific, professionalized, research-driven, value-neutral scholarship. At the same time, because classics had been, and for a few decades yet would be, at the center of American education, at least some members of our association were reluctant to give up entirely the idea that classical scholarship had a moral aim. The tension between scientific objectivity and the traditional aim of classics, a traditional vision of classics as morally centered, produced a gradual shift from moral to epistemic virtue in descriptions of the ideal scholar. Concern with the epistemic virtues of scholarship continues to surface in the records of the APA and the occasional writings of classicists through the uh, 20th century. And when it does, problems begin to arise. The chief difficulty, uh, as Warren Riggs points out, 
is to say just what's distinctive about epistemic virtue. Epistemic virtues tend to merge with general moral virtues or to be special cases of them. They're really hard to nail down. Uh, we can all agree that a scholar should be honest, but shouldn't everyone be honest, scholar or not? Um, many traits that we might naturally count as epistemic virtues have analogs that are moral virtues, or maybe the same trait is both epistemic and moral, and philosophers throw this back and forth all the time. The challenge that Benjamin Dwight and our founders faced never quite went away. What distinctive good does classical scholarship do? In 1930, for example, our society was still small enough that the APA, the AIA, and the Linguistic Society of America could not only hold a joint meeting but sit down for a joint dinner together. And the after-dinner exercises on December 30th of 1930 consisted of brief speeches on the qualities of the scholar. Speakers treated vision, enthusiasm, research, ginger, industry, and literature. I'm not sure I know what ginger is, but, uh, but vision is one of the epistemic virtues singled out by Ernest Sosa. Industry, though, distinguishes beyond scholarship when I call, have to call a plumber, I hope he's industrious. And saying that research and literature are the virtues of literary researchers uh, sounds to me like a tautology. 20 years after that 1930 dinner, one of my own teachers, Gilbert Hyatt, asked, what kind of man or woman will the good teacher be? And his answer picked out three qualities, memory, willpower, and kindness. Memory and willpower, at least, count as epistemic virtues, but willpower has a moral analog, and kindness certainly extends beyond scholarship. A few years later, Hyatt set out to list the qualities necessary for a life of learning. For him, they were devotion, humility, organization, and collaboration. And he was honest enough to admit that he wasn't very good at collaboration. Linda Zegzebski counts intellectual humility among the epistemic virtues, but the fact that she needs to qualify it as specifically intellectual humility points to the extension of it beyond the sphere of intellect. And we could probably say the same of devotion and organization. The founders of the APA then retained classical studies traditional concern with ethical formation, but shifted emphasis from moral virtue to epistemic virtue. In this, they and their successors were not alone, and perhaps they were not entirely successful in working out the implications of that shift. But alongside this continuing occupation with the personal qualities of an ethical scholar runs another concern, driven not by the philological, but by the American part of our original name. Our founders wondered not only what it meant to be a good philologist, but what it might mean to be a good American philologist. At the preliminary meeting in November 68 to consider formation of a philological association, uh, Professor George Fisk Comfort, who was up here, uh, <laughs> called, uh, he's the guy with the beard and the hat, um, called for an association adapted to the present wants of America in regard to philological science. And at first, uh, this took the form of attention to the one area that Americans could hope to make their own, and Matt reminded of us uh, of that, the philology of the Aboriginal American languages. Volumes of Tapa through the 1870s show articles on the Algonquin verb and on numerals in American Indian languages, side by side with treatments of irregular verbs in Anglo-Saxon and the substantive use of the Greek participle. But when you look a little deeper, most of the articles on indigenous languages are by one scholar, J. Hammond Trumbull, 1821-1897, and they fade out when he does uh, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the 1870s. The early leaders of the APA gave a somewhat different answer to Comfort's call for a learned society adapted to the present wants of America, and especially to America's growing international influence in, in the years around the First World War. In 1914, Edward Capp's presidential address to the 115 scholars present at our annual meeting focused on demonstrating the maturity of American scholarship. Now, Capps was a committed internationalist. He was a friend of Woodrow Wilson. He was a minister plenipotentiary to Greece and Montenegro in 
and uh, a member of the managing committee of the school at Athens for about 40 years, I think. He saw the APA as one instrument of America's cultural influence. In 1917 and again in 1918, the APA passed official resolutions urging the American government to protect the interests of American museums and archaeological expeditions in Greece and the Middle East during the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. But what does philology have to do with being a good citizen? And some sense of the perplexity that inevitably surrounds this question can be seen in the text of the resolution that we passed in 1917. Uh, in that, at that point, we appointed a committee of three to urge upon the government of the United States during peace negotiations in the Middle East the importance of paying attention to a whole laundry list of issues that don't seem philological in nature. General education, medical schools, hospitals, training in agriculture, forestry, engineering, transportation, and road making, economic geology and mining, geological and geographical explorations, and scientific surveys. Uh, we may have seen the American empire coming and wanted a piece of it. Thus, to the moral virtue of traditional classical education and its modification into the epistemic virtue of classical scholarship, we can add a third term, civic virtue, the qualities of a good citizen. And I don't have time this morning to unweave this thread, but I think we can find a concern with civic virtue and with the philologist as citizen surfacing at critical moments in our societies and country's history, including the present one. But those who want to connect classical scholarship with civic virtue or with social justice face the same challenge that our founders and early leaders confronted. They have to explain what the connection is. We seem unable to escape the idea, though, that as classicists, we're engaged in a profoundly ethical endeavor, and we continue to struggle with Howard Hong's question, what good do we do? And with that question, I will leave you. Well, I think we're back on schedule more or less. We have time for a question. Yes, in the corner. Uh, my question is about nationalism. Please go to the board. My question is about nationalism, uh, which I think about the last slide that you alluded to, which is <coughs> civic good. And it strikes me that one of the tensions of classical studies, or even philology, is that it's transnational history, but also actual practice. And I was wondering where Anthony Vinyl put Eric Adler's um, material on the rejection of German. Um, well, it's an uneasy fit, always. Uh, the, the, uh, and in the, the 2005 book, I, that's really what I was, in a way, talking about, was the idea that um, yep, classical scholarship is, uh, is, as you say, transnational. And the... the it, it, in my own view, the Greeks and Romans don't actually belong to anybody. And they're very hard to pin down. I mean, think about what happens when you look at an ancient room in Pompeii and you ask the question, what was this for? What did they do in here? If you look at our rooms, and it may be just cultural, you, you know this is a bedroom. This is a study. This is a living room. Not so easy with a cubiculum, you know, whatever that is. So I think there's a kind of an openness about the classical world that invites everybody in, but then everybody says, what room am I in? You know, what does it mean to be in the American room or the German room? Um, in, the, in the years after or, the, or around the, the First World War, um, Well, actually, let me go back a little bit farther than that to the, uh, the period of Gildersleeve's education. When the, the, at that point, the, the enemies that we remembered were English. 
And so the idea of going to Oxford or Cambridge to develop philological wisdom uh, was not on. And the, the, uh, the people who we looked up to and admired were German. And there's a long string of American scholars going to going to German to Germany to study, as you know. Uh, with the with the, the First World War, that that obviously changed somewhat. But I think you know I think we. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I but I think there is always this tension between the the broad possibilities of classical studies and the specific room that we want to find ourselves in. I and I don't know that there's a way to escape that. Uh, I mean, I, you know, is there a way for, for me to be anything other than an American classical scholar? I, I don't think so. I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I can't, I mean, I'm certainly as, probably as, as evil as anybody, but I, I, um, <laughs> I, I can't speak for, for, you know, for, for the generality of evil people, but I know what I would do if I wanted to be bad as a teacher. I'd focus on the hardcore, re, the, the realin, on the, the, the sort of the, the pieces of our discipline, and they are glorious pieces, that can be made value neutral. Um, and I, it, so I think that's, you know, the, I, I, I can't say obviously what people are thinking when they, when they read things. But I suspect that it's probably easier to, you know, to talk about the, the uh, and I, I, I hope people are not hearing any disparagement of, of hardcore philology in this, because it's, it's one of the things I do and one of the things I love to do. Um, I, I for, for many years, I taught seventh grade Latin, and I, teaching grammar was the meaningful part of what I did. But with that said, I suspect it might be easier in teaching, let's say, um, the early part of the Metamorphoses, it might be easier to focus on manuscript tradition and textual variants in the Apollo Daphne or on the Python myth or things like that nature than on uh, pursuit and rape. And those are hard topics. And there's, there's a, as everybody knows, there's a book on doing just that. So I think that's, you know, that's part of the, um, that's part of that tension I mentioned between the, the, the tug we felt early on to compete with some fairly new but obviously very important inst American institutions, the Smithsonian, and, in fact, uh, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and our, our older impulse, which is to end with a capstone in moral philosophy. That's all, that tension has always been there. And it has to be, I think it has to be worked out at the individual and possibly the, you know, the sort of local level before it gets worked out anywhere else. It's hard to do that in a national thing. There's a wonderful, uh, in the, at our first proceedings, the Smithsonian sent a kind, one of those you know, letters of good wishes you know, happy success with your new project. And uh, in the minutes of that meeting, someone stood up, it may have been George Comfort, stood up and said, well, it's nice to see an olive branch from science to philology, you know. <laughs> so.
it's kind of there's already a sense that you know that tension was there. I'm reminded uh, in thinking about this question of cui bono and hardcore philology of the quip of Shackleton Bailey to that question, which was, well, it beats dropping bombs. <laughs>